conscience conscience is invoked often today catholics themselves catholic politicians invoke conscience to promote their views on child sacrifice in fact there is a catholic doctrine of conscience look at that today from primer's moral theology manual Jesus is King. Welcome to the One Peter Five podcast, rebuilding Christendom, restoring Catholic culture and tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, editor in chief of One Peter Five. Welcome to today's episode. Happy Advent! It is Monday of the first week of Advent, and as always, we promote the liturgyofthehome.com calendar, which is for Advent. We have the first Sunday of Advent. Obviously, uh, the article Advent Uncensored at 1 Peter 5, we go into some of the liturgical considerations about the Latin Mass, but you can get this at liturgyofthehome.com. It is, today's a great time, this time, for all of the family customs, all of the things that your children get into that remember every year, and this calendar is a great way to do that. My children love that. It's a great way to catechize the kids. So first week of Advent has begun. And we also are doing our fundraiser for 1 Peter 5. We do fundraisers twice a year. And we are an on so we, re- we depend on your donations to get us through this year. We are trying to raise $60,000 to be able to cover all of our costs for the coming year for the first half. Then we'll do our second fundraiser in May. So if you can donate, please donate and help us. Again, we are a nonprofit and we rely on your tax deductible donations to provide this content for free to promote promote traditional Catholicism. So if you can, please donate. Go to onepeter5.com slash donate. And that will help us reach our budget goals for the coming year. So thanks a lot. Appreciate your consideration. So let's get into our topic. We are promoting the new publication of our partner, Benedictus Books. And they just republished the Handbook of Moral Theology. This was the the old version. I've got a nice coffee stain on it. Um, The Handbook of Moral Theology by Dominic Primer. And this has been republished by Benedictus Books. They publish the monthly Latin Mass Companion. If you may use that, go to praybenedictus.com. You can subscribe to Benedictus, the monthly Latin Mass Companion. But this text is very, very important, and it forms a, a, a fantastic Christmas gift for priests or seminarians. And the reason is because, especially in diocesan seminaries, Unfortunately, seminarians are not given the classical moral theological training. And we're going to go over a very important piece of that today. We're just going to read some of Prumer and we'll comment on that. A very important aspect of that, which is this Catholic doctrine of conscience. And this text, um, what's great about it is it it has, first of all, it has a a forward by Father Chad Ripperger. We've had we had Father Ripperger on in the summer when this this was first coming out. Um, But it also has a fantastic new index. The new index has all sorts of modern moral questions that were not included in the original version. So it points the readers to all all sorts of the basics for these modern questions. Um, And so this is this text is it's hard to overestimate or overstate how incredibly important this text is. Uh, I remember having a, a priest. Um, tell me that in in our diocesan seminary, um, they didn't. They not only didn't have Prumer, they didn't have Saint Alphonsus. All they had was Henri de Lubac for their moral theology. They did not have this traditional moral theological grounding, which is so important. Uh, Katie's in the chat. Hi, Katie. She says I've been getting the Benedictus books since it started. It's fabulous. Yeah, it's a really great, uh, you know, especially, you know, you don't have to lug around a huge missile. You know, if you got your father, the father of the missile is kind of big, 
but the Benedictus Latin Mass Companion is very great because it's very portable. Um, it you just get it every month. It's it's fantastic. So, um, so let's get into some of the uh, primer here. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to go um, into uh, the the Catholic doctrine of conscience. And the reason I wanted to just do this is because I think it it really helps with a lot of different aspects, not only with the, the false invocation of conscience, but I think it also helps people who may have a troubled conscience for various reasons, whether that's scruples or or they're, you know, we're, de we're dealing with a situation where we may have to discern whether or not we should disobey an ecclesiastical authority. And we are having a crisis of conscience. And so this doctrine of conscience is absolutely fundamental. And I, so I wanted to also point out below the, in the link uh, on this uh, YouTube show, there is a link to this entire text. We, we just published this whole text in uh, on onepeter5.com. So this is this is um, in regards to Peter Kwasniewski's book, True Obedience in the Church, which talks all about it, it actually quotes one of the more recent teachings on conscience, which is which is actually quite traditional. And um, this if we go into this, it's very, very critical. So if you scroll down on this, it, it talks about why this is important. But um, if you scroll down here, it talks all about these different things. Um, so that's what I'm going to be quoting from. Uh, but what we have here is this is the actual text of the moral theological manual that we'll be quoting from. Um, so first, what is conscience? What is what is the conscience? All, always let your conscience be your guide, as they say. Well, here is the Catholic doctrine of conscience, according to Dominic Prumer. And, you know, let me let me first quickly comment before we actually get into this. I just want to comment on the, the authority of this manual. So this manual the is really based on the, the best tradition of moral theology before Vatican II. So this manual was considered a textbook, which was it was taught in many, many seminarians, seminaries before Vatican II. So this was considered just the standard textbook that you would teach out of. There was a there was actually a three volume set that's in Latin that's still not translated into English, but this one volume summary is translated into English, and so the um, it was often the case that people would always say, "Look it up in Primer before Vatican II," and so that is why this this manual is very vastly considered to be a standard, just a standard textbook. That so that's why when we when we share these teachings, th these are basically summary teachings. These are not something that's really controversial. These are just the summary of the traditional teaching on these, these matters. Okay, so let's get into it. So this is paragraph 135, as you can see on your screen here. What is the conscience? Primer says this, quote, conscience is the judgment or dictate of the practical intellect deciding from general principles the goodness or evil of some act which is to be done here and now or has been done in the past. So he breaks, so that's the definition, and then he breaks it down. This is what's so great about Primer is that he gives a, a very clear definition, and then he breaks down exactly what that means. So the first thing is it's a, it's a dictate of the practical intellect, and so it's judging something. It's not the speculative intellect. Meaning it's not we're not speculating about something in the abstract. We're actually looking at something in the concrete, something that's right here, right now. So it's a judgment for the here and now. So we're so we're talking about general principles, things that are generally true, general laws, general principles of moral behavior. And then we're applying those to this particular situation that we're in right now. So I am in a moral situation. And my conscience is applying the general principles to this particular situation. And that's what your conscience does. That's what a Catholic conscience is. So it's judging right and wrong for this situation right now 
based on the general principles of right and wrong. So right off, right off the bat, we already have the refutation of the liberal proposition regarding conscience because the the liberal proposition to say, well, I can invoke my conscience against uh, the Catholic doctrine of contraception, the Catholic doctrine of abortion. I can invoke my conscience for that. Well, that's completely wrong because the conscience takes the general principles and applies it to this situation. So the general principles, humanae vitae, casti canubiae, etc., condemn contraception as intrinsically evil. Something that's intrinsically evil is always and everywhere in every situation wrong. So it, in, in effect, you don't even need to use your conscience. It's, it's in this, in this case, something, when something's intrinsically evil, there's never a case where it would be good to do. So you don't need to, you know, think about your conscience and, and evoke your conscience at all in this case, because we're talking about something that's intrinsically evil. So we've already got abortion is intrinsically evil. Uh, contraception is intrinsically evil. We're, we, we can even add adultery is intrinsically evil. Veritate Splendor by John Paul II. So those are these are cases actually where you don't even need to you know have a conscience, conscientious moment because the general principles always apply in the same way to every single situation. Okay, so that's that's what it means by something that's intrinsically evil. It's always evil, period. So you, you there's it's impossible to invoke one's conscience in this particular case about an intrinsically evil. Something that's intrinsically evil is according to the general principle, always evil, period. Okay, so we already have determined, based on this definition, that when we're dealing with our conscience, when we're applying our conscience to a particular situation, it has to be something that's not intrinsically evil. We can't we can't use our conscience about something that's intrinsically evil. It's, it's already been decided for us. So this definition does not even come into play with intrinsically evil, intrinsic evils. So we're only talking about things that are not intrinsically evil. So let's continue. Now, Prumer makes, he, he, he breaks down some of the basics of what a conscience is. He breaks down the definition a little bit more, and you can go read through that on the, on the link if you'd like, or you can buy the text. Uh, and that reminds me, I forgot to put the link to this actually so you can go to sophia press that's the um Sophia press prumer let me make sure i've got this okay so handbook of moral theology at sophia institute press that is the actual um link where you can buy the text uh because benedictus is owned by sophia press so I'm just going to put that link in there as well, just so you have that, so you can buy the actual text. Trust me, you will not regret buying the text. It is worth $25. It's worth $50. It's worth $100. I bought this old reprint. I got it. I got lucky. I think I got it for like $50, but now it's a lot more affordable, $25. So, okay, let's continue. Okay, so he breaks down what the definition is, and you can go read those, like I said. Uh, so we're going to keep on going. Let me see. Where are we? Um, what number? 137. Okay. So he talks about the different kinds of conscience. Okay. We're going to talk about these different aspects of conscience. Okay. So here's, here's, this is paragraph 137, number two. So let's, let's go through this part. This is, this is very interesting to look at these different aspects and different kinds of consciences, okay? So we already went through the conscience is a practical intellect. We're talking about practical, concrete realities. Here and now, we're making a judgment, true or false, good or evil, right here, right now. Okay. So now Prumer says this, in regards to its conformity with etern eternal law, conscience is true, correct, when it deduces correctly from true principles that some act is lawful. It is false or erroneous when it decides from false principles, consider it as true, that something is lawful when in fact it is unlawful. Okay, so we've already got that. We, we talked about that previously. 
Continuing on, an erroneous conscience is further distinguished into a scrupulous conscience, which is for useless and almost ridiculous reasons, judges or rather fears that an act is evil when in fact it is not. B, a perplexed conscience, which sees sins both in the performance and the omission of some act. C, a lax conscience, which judges on insufficient grounds that there is no sin in the act or that the sin is not so grave as it is in fact. And the worst form of this conscience is a hardened conscience, which as the result of long established habit of sinning regards all or at least some sins to be of little importance. So I'm just going to highlight this text here if I can, just for the benefit of those who are viewing this. So we've got the so we've got the true conscience and the the false conscience, and then of the false the false the forms of fa a false conscience. There are these different forms of the false conscience: scrupulous, perplexed, perplexed, hardened, and then there is also the Pharisaic conscience, or we might say rigid in the bad way, perhaps a Pharisaic conscience which minimizes grave sins but magnifies matters of little importance in the same way as the Pharisees behaved. So we're, we'll get into why are these distinctions important? What is this distinction? True or false? Where do we go from there? Now, there's also very important distinctions here in regard to the act of assent. Can, 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 conscience is either certain when, without any prudent fear of error, it firmly decides that some act is either lawful or unlawful, or it is probable when it judges that some act is probably lawful or unlawful, or it is doubting when it hesitates to pass judgment on the moral character of an act. So, now, those are, here's, the, the, here's the general distinctions and principles of what a conscience is different forms of that conscience. And now Prumer takes this the, the next step further. Go, continuing on, here's the next, the next step. How, what does this apply to moral acts? Here's the first principle, the true conscience and the false conscience. Paragraph 138. Everyone is obliged to use serious care to possess on all occasions a true conscience. So, we have to, therefore, thus we need to use the means for obtaining a true conscience, which Prumer lineates here. And what I love about Prumer is that he doesn't just talk about all these different moral principles and moral aspects of the moral act. He gives all this practical advice. It's fantastic. The means to be used for obtaining a true conscience are A, a careful knowledge of the laws which govern our moral life. B, taking wise counsel. C, prayer to the Father of light. D, removal of obstacles to a true conscience, chief amongst which is the obscurity resultant, resulting from unforgiven sin. In other words, go to confession. Go to confession because sin darkens your intellect. You can't actually understand what's going on because sin makes you stupid, unfortunately. And so your, your conscience becomes darkened. So here's here's where, again, this again refutes any sort of liberal notion of conscience, because we have we have an obligation to form our consciences so that they are true. This is our obligation. We have to form them so that they are true. And here are the means to do so. Now, here's where it gets a little interesting. Second principle. Everyone is obliged to follow his conscience, whether it commands or forbids some action, not only when it is true, but also when it is in invincible error. Now, let me let me see. I didn't put the invincible versus vincible in here. Where where is that? Um, let's see if I can find it real quick. So, invincible. Invince, uh, oh, I think it's under ignorance. Oh, look at this. See, definition and kinds of ignorance. So, 
there are different types of in ignorance. There is vincible or invincible. So here's here's where Prumer breaks down again. Vincible and invincible ignorance. In relation to its subject, meaning the person having the having the knowledge or not, being ignorant or not, ignorance is either vincible or invincible, depending on whether it can or cannot be removed by reasonable care, such as would be employed by prudent and upright men in similar circumstances. So, and then he talks about the degree of your carelessness. So, if you are so vincible ignorance, here's all different aspects of the invincible and the vincible. Basically, the bottom line here is that we are all obliged to form our conscience so it is true. And we are even obliged to follow a conscience that's in error if and only if it is in invincible error. In other words, we had no way of knowing otherwise. We had no way of knowing otherwise. We didn't. We took all reasonable care, what every prudent man would consider. Now, I have an analogy for this because, you know, people, we either have the liberal view of conscience, which is where we have, you know, you evoke your conscience to just disregard the moral law, disregard intrinsic evils. Or on the other hand, we actually have a hyper papalist view of conscience, which is where the hyper papalist must obey stringently every single whim of the Pope. The hyper papalist must defend every single whim of the Pope because their conscience is defined by, not by Catholic doctrine, not by Catholic tradition, not by the formation of a true conscience, but their conscience has been set aside so that they must will and act according to what the Pope wills and acts in every whim of the Pope. And I think what we're, we're pointing to here is that the Catholic doctrine of conscience points us to a middle way, a more moderate approach here between these two extremes, which is one is just denying, completely denying that even conscience can exist essentially on the paper hyper papalist side and on the, the liberal heretic side, it's an invoking, invoking of conscience where it cannot be invoked. So let's continue. We'll just close out some of these. So paragraph 139, where are we? So the second principle looking at this, continuing on. So you're obliged to follow a conscience, even if it is in error, but only if it's in invincible error. So he gives an example. Thus, for example, a person who is convinced that he ought to tell a lie in order to save his friend from some danger is bound to tell the lie. In so doing, he does not commit a formal sin. Anyone who thinks that today is a fast day, although as a matter of fact, it is not. And in spite of conviction, does not observe the fast, commits formal sin. So an example just happened on the Friday after Thanksgiving. Because people may have thought that it you you know you could eat your turkey on friday after thanksgiving when in fact it's not true that you can eat your turkey but if you acted on a true conscience or even on an invincibly erroneous conscience you did not commit a formal sin let's say let somebody somebody really thought that it was a fast day so they fasted but in fact it wasn't a fast day or they really thought it was not a fast day so they did not fast so this this is something that helps a scrupulous conscience because if, you're, if your conscience is scrupulous and you are fretting about these different things, you need to realize that if you have made a reasonable care to form your, your conscience to make it true, and you did your best to do what was right, even if, if it turned out later it was wrong, you did not commit a sin. Because you cannot know what you cannot know. Especially if you've striven for it. So, let's continue. Third principle, it is not permissible to follow conscience when it is in vincible error, no matter whether it commands or forbids some action. On the other hand, one cannot act contrary to such a conscience. The error must be corrected before any action is taken. So, Prumer brings out the fact that 
you have to have a certain conscience. You have to be certain about what your conscience is telling you. If you're doubtful about this, you should you should not act. If you're doubtful and you know that you could find the answer, then you should try to find the answer. He goes on, a certain conscience alone is the is the lawful guide of morality. A vincibly erroneous conscience is not a certain conscience. And consequently, a man who acts while his conscience is in that state exposes himself to the danger of sin. If a man's conscience is in error through his own fault, then he must correct that error by taking suitable means to discover the truth. If his efforts fail, he must refrain from action. But if even this is impossible, then he must choose what appears to be the safer course. But this is this is good news. Katie says this is good to hear. Glad to hear that. Because unfortunately, we can get scrupulous. Um, and that can be something that is very difficult to overcome. Now, here's here's the lad the lax conscience. This is where the liberal heretics have this last conscience, which is based it has has to do with bad education violent disorderly passions or a life of vice and once again practical advice here's what you do you pray you go to confession and then you remove the cause of laxity i just want to touch on the scrupulous conscience here he says a scrupulous conscience is a state of groundless fear rather than the judgment of a healthy mind and he says there's different causes different signs and here's uh here's the remedies he gives the removal of their causes for which the aid of an experienced doctor is often necessary, perfect obedience to a wise director, healthy recreation and manual or spiritual work to distract the mind from the scrupulous thoughts, fervent and assiduous prayer to God, the father of light and the source of peace. So he goes on and there's many different other distinctions which you, you can get into and you can go read the, the whole section on conscience that we published at 1 Peter 5. But you can go and buy this, this whole handbook of moral theology to get all the different distinctions and further applications and all the practical wisdom. So we're going to go through this more. We're going to go through different aspects of this. Feel free to comment below if you want any particular moral question looked into that, that Primer can answer. Um, happy to look through that and we can look through some of the text of Primer and we can discuss it. Um, a lot of moral quandaries are resolved when we look at really the Catholic moral theology. And so I hope this has been helpful. I hope this has um, given you a little bit more peace, perhaps. Um, and uh, the Catholic doctrine of conscience is real. And we should take care to form our conscience and make sure that our conscience is true. But we should also trust that God, the Father of light, will give us true understanding that God wants us to go to heaven and he, he doesn't want us to sin. And so when we genuinely ask him for this grace of a true conscience, he will give us that. And we need to trust that God is merciful to sinners and he will hear our prayers through the mother of God. So let's offer up an Ave at the end of this. And we'll offer our Ave to the mother of God under her Russian icon and ask Our Lady to give us a true and certain conscience. In nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus Tecum, benedicta tuum liarbus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Blessed and poor Carl, pray for us. Saint Maximilian Colby, pray for us. In nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Amen.